Hey everybody, welcome back to Gaff University. I'm Colby Cox, and today we're going to talk about the Pathsetter IUL from FNG. Now, we're only going to be giving you an overview of it and going over a couple of parts of the illustration because we were honored a while back to have Danielle Davis from FNG go over how to run the software and she went over a few other parts of the illustration. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to fill in some of the gaps that we didn't get at that presentation. But if you missed it and you need to see how to illustrate it, make sure you click up here and this will take you to that video. Otherwise, we're going to get started. Okay, so Pathsetter IUL, elbow ages 0 to 80, minimum death benefit of 50K, maximum amount of premium, half a million, but you can get potentially off his approval for more if needed okay they have a couple different underwriting classes we won't get too much into that they do have exam free underwriting zero to 50 through a million bucks anything above a million dollars probably going to have to have an exam anything above age 50 more than likely is going to have an exam now again with covid they might waive some of that but because we've gotten into vaccines and things like that they've kind of relegated back to this um underwriting method okay there are withdrawals you can do partial or surrender uh there are surrender charges they go for 15 years okay so this product does have a higher surrender than a lot of other ones a lot of them uh, especially in the permanent space are 10 there are other 15s out there but this one uh, and f and g in general is a 15 year surrender okay um and then with loans you can have to do fixed or variable very similar to most other iuls um Fixed loan just has a certain rate set to it. Variable can change um, depending on what's going on in the market. Okay, right now it's at five. So you can decide at that point when you take a loan what you want to do. Death benefit options. Again, very similar to other IULs, other permanent products. You can do option A, option B. Option A is level. Option B is increasing. Okay, so we have other another video that we're going to be doing here in the future coming up very soon that talks about the difference between an increasing and a level policy. Um, but just so you know, level is where death benefit stays the same throughout. Increasing is where you have a death benefit and the cash value grows on top of it. Okay, So over time, you have a higher death benefit because you're going to take the death benefit plus, uh, plus, <laughs> plus the cash value. Okay. A couple of different riders, and, and here in a second, we're going to go real in-depth when we look at the illustration on what the accelerated benefit riders are. You have terminal illness, critical illness, and chronic illness. So again, I'm not going to spend too much time on those at this moment. When we look at an illustration here in a second, I'm going to go over it and show you how it pays out. There is a waiver of monthly deductions that if you are totally disabled for a continuous period of six months or more, they'll waive monthly charges during that disability, okay? So that prevents the cancellation of coverage, keeps the surrender value from being depleted due to those monthly charges. There's a waiver of specified premium. There's an accidental death benefit rider, overloan protection rider. If we're looking at the far column on the right, we have primary insured term life rider. This is just essentially, you've got your coverage, you want more coverage, but you don't want to pay the full permanent price. You can get a term rider that attaches to it. You can do a spouse term rider where you add a spouse to that policy or a children's level term rider. Okay, so a lot of these riders are very common across IULs with different carriers and different products, um, but we just wanted to highlight a few of them. Uh, there's an account value bonus. So if you keep this policy past 10 years, 11 and on, you can get uh, interesting, uh, you'll get a 0.25 persistency bonus for the fixed and indexed account, meaning keep it for the long haul, they're going to give you a little bonus um, for at year 11 and on. Okay, um, so huge benefit there to keeping the policy with FNG. Now, products are always changing. Benefits are getting better. So I'm not saying don't ever change it, but that's something to take into consideration if you're looking to switch or if you're looking for your client to switch. <laughs> and then you have the no lapse guarantee. Okay, if you pay the minimum premium, which we'll look at an illustration here in a second to kind of gauge what that looks like. If you at least pay that guaranteed minimum, you'll at least keep the policy for 15 years because, again, the surrender is 15 years. So there is flexibility with this product. You're paying 500 Maybe your minimum is 250 and as long as you pay 250 you get to keep all the benefits. I, that may not be the case for everybody, um, 
but it, for most policies, you're going to have a reduction in that premium that as long as you pay that, you keep everything in force. You're not growing cash value. And remember, this product is a cash value product. It's designed for accumulation. It's designed to be a, an SRA, a supplemental retirement, potentially. And so if you're only paying minimum, you're not growing cash, which is the biggest benefit of this IUL. And so we need to take that consideration as well, but it does allow some flexibility. Hey, Christmas comes around. You want some extra money uh, for presents and whatnot. Reduce it down to minimum for that month. Go back up the next month, okay? Now, we're going to look at these rates, okay? And there's a difference between low band and fully underwritten, and you can see on the bottom right what each means. So there's the S&P, the Barclays, and a fixed the S&P, one thing that's really attractive with F&G is their caps and their par rates. Their strategies are pretty impressive as far as accumulation because they're designed for accumulation. That is what their primary purpose is. And so you're looking here, we'll look at the S&P 500, uh, 100 participation uh, annual point to point. That's what the APTP means. The cap on the low band is 12%. While fully underwritten is 13. That's pretty impressive right now. A lot of carriers are sitting around the 9, 10 mark, okay, with a couple of 12s in there. But for most part, it's around that 9 to 10 mark at this moment here sitting in July of 2021. Um, but what's the difference between low band and fully underwritten? So if you're low band, that's because your age is 0 to 45 and you have a death benefit under 150K. Now, that doesn't mean everybody under 45 um, qualifies only for low band. What it means is you have to be 0 to 45 and a death benefit of 150K or less, okay? The reason they do that is because if you're in that age range and you have that less death benefit, they don't do a full underwriting, okay? Now, that doesn't mean exam. That means they don't gra grab or go get all the other information that they would if your death benefit was above 150 Because remember what I said, uh, under a million, zero to 50, no medical exam. So just because you fall uh, under 45 and you've got a quarter million, you got above that 150, doesn't mean you have to take a medical. It just means they may not reach for all those other different data points um, when it comes to underwriting. So if you fall under that zero to 45, under 150K, you're going to get 12 instead of 13. Now, again, most people depending on how their product's set up. And again, this is an IUL. It's designed for cash accumulation. The only way to get more cash is to put more money into it, which means a higher death benefit. You may not even need or worry about the 12 or 13. Both are still great, but the low band is there just because of those people that have uh, 0 to 45 age, less than 150K. And it's for every single strategy. So we're looking at S&P. They have another 100% participation, annual point-to-point, -point, with a 1% bonus. Notice caps go lower because they are giving you that bonus of 8 and 9.5. We're looking at next 140% participation rate. That's pretty fantastic. Annual point-to-point, 8.5 on that cap, 9.5 on fully underwritten. Uh, what does participation mean again? It means you participate in that amount of growth depending on what the market does. So if the market does 10 and you have 140% participation rate, that means you would make 14% on that strategy. But again, your cap's 9.5, so you're going to be capped at 9.5. But if the market does 1, you get 1.4. Okay, so that's what the benefit there would be. And then you have the monthly point to point, 3.5, 4.25, very simple, month to month. That's all it is. Okay, that's why that cap's lower. And then you've got the Barclays which has a 130% participation with a 1% bonus. Notice it's got nothing in that second column where the caps are because there's no cap. It's 130% par, and that's what it is, uncapped. Uh, and then with fully underwritten, it's 145% participation rate. Now, this one's not on the S&P. It's on the Barclays. And we'll look here in a second. When we go into the illustration, we'll look at the historicals there. Uh, I haven't mentioned this far right column. What is it? Well, the far right column is the illustrated rate, okay? Meaning, what's the maximum illustration rate you can show for each strategy? So if you're fully underwritten, S&P 100% par, annual point to point, you can illustrate at 7.47. So it's really just for the illustration purposes of what is the max illustrated rate I can show, okay? And then the last thing is the fixed rate, low band 4.5, 4.75. Uh, this is just a fixed rate, okay? 
you put some money in there, that's what it's going to make. Nothing more, nothing less. That's the case, okay? So like I said, here in a second, we'll look at the history, uh, I'm sorry, the historicals of these strategies, all right? But what I'm going to do now is let's get into the illustration and let's talk about a few of the other things that Danielle didn't go over for us. And if, remember, if you did miss how to actually illustrate it, how to use the software, click this video right here, okay? That way you can check it out, see how to illustrate it, and then you can see where she talks about the income. And what I'm going to talk about more so is the living benefits, the accelerated riders, plus the minimum premium, and we'll take a look at those historicals, okay? All right, so here we have the illustration, okay? F and G, they're out of Iowa. Here's for the client, your information, and like I said, Danielle's gone over quite a bit of this already in those previous that previous video, um, so check it out. We're going to go over a couple different things. The first thing I'm going to go over is those living benefits. So we're going to scroll down here. The very last page shows the numbers for living be the accelerated benefits or living benefits. So excuse me if you're confused there. Living benefits, accelerated benefits, same thing. Okay. Um, it, I'll show you here in a second where it shows the definitions of the terminal illness, chronic illness, critical illness, what they are, how they work. They're actually in the middle of the illustration, but the last page actually shows the numbers, and that's what I want to show. So. Remember, a terminal illness is when a physic physician diagnoses the insured uh, that they have a life expectancy of 24 months or less. Okay, you can accelerate up to 100% of the death benefit, not to exceed a million dollars. So, if you have a death benefit above a million, millions the max. Now, that does not mean you are going to get the full death benefit if your uh, death benefits under a million. It just means you can accelerate up to it because remember an accelerated benefit is an advancement of the death benefit because the death benefit is upon death. An accelerated benefit, you haven't passed away, you haven't died, so you get the accelerated rate. So it's going to be a certain percentage deducted from whatever that death benefit is and then that's what you get. So this one shows an example, age 70. Now I am showing a client that's 35, paying 500 bucks a month. The death benefit here is 589,000, as you can see right here. So based on that, if this client at age 70 needed a terminal illness rider, they'd get 387,000, $386 upfront tax for here you go. Use it to, to heal yourself, go on vacation, buy a nice car, whatever the case may be. Now that does seem a little bit lower because the advancement is usually pretty significant because terminal illness, again, they're assuming you're going to pass away relatively soon. But it's also because I ran this showing an income at 65. And again, Danielle shows that income in her video. So because I've already been receiving an income since, since 65, and at 70 I'm labeled terminally ill, that's why it's a little bit less. If I haven't taken an income out of this, it would be more. All right, Because remember, when you take out that income, it reduces upon, uh, from your death benefit upon death which is why I don't have as much for my living benefit if needed. Um, now, that doesn't mean you have to wait till 70, because again, this client's 35. This goes into effect uh, within 30 days, if not right away. And so if something happens at 45, you have this rider. Okay, the older you are, the more money you'll get. So you may not get as much at 45 as you would at 55 or 65, but it is still there. All right, so the next one is the chronic illness. Now, this is where you can accelerate up to 25% of the policy's death benefit um, if the insured is certified by a licensed healthcare practitioner in the previous 12 months as having a qualifying chronic illness. Okay, what is a qualifying chronic illness? That is defined as where you can un you are unable to perform two of the six activities of daily living. Okay. What are those activities of daily living? That is uh, bathing, consonants, dressing, eating, toileting, and transferring. If you can't do two of those six, you can access this rider. Okay. Now, like I said, you advance up to 25% of, uh, of it. Uh, again, the maximum being a million dollars. So how does this work? Let's say at age 40, you're able labeled chronically ill. You get $110,000. 50, 115, 60, 117, 70, 96. Notice, again, it goes down because at 65, they're assuming I've taken some money out of this. I've been using it as, as that income uh, or an SRA. 
And so that's why it does go down. Now, if you don't take an income, that number will just keep going up. So you, like I said, you're going to get 25% of that death benefit um, depending on uh, what age you get, are labeled chron uh, chronically ill. So the older we get, the little bit more that, that you'll get. Now, they'll give this money tax-free. Do what you want with it. You can use it to pay your bills, heal, go on vacation, whatever the case may be. You pass away, whatever's left is going to be there for your family. With terminal illness, they're going to give you this money and that's it. There's nothing left. They're giving you as much money as possible. But with chronic, they're going to give you this money, and then you still have something left over, which also means you can access this rider again if you need it in two more years. It's always going to just be 25% of that death benefit. So the benefit's going to go down, but it is still there. And the last one, scroll down a little bit, is critical illness. All right. Now, this benefit allows you to accelerate up to 100% of the death benefit, not to exceed a million, just like terminal illness, just like chronic illness. But what are the critical illnesses? What do they cover? It covers heart attack, stroke, major, major organ transplant, paralysis, diagnosis of ALS, which is Lou Gehrig's disease, uh, arterial aneurysms, central nervous system tumors, significant burns, and end stage renal failure diagnosis. Uh, and invasive cancer. Okay, so if one of those happens to you, depending on how severe it is, there's four different categories, minor, moderate, severe, and critical. Depend on the severity will determine how much you get and depending on your age. So if I it's minor and I'm 40, notice I'll get $88,000. But if it's minor and I'm 70, $238,000. If it's severe and I'm 40, 176. But if it's severe and I'm 60, 383. So notice the older we get, the more severe it is, the more money we get. Now, again, it's assuming at 65 I'm taking an income, which is why at 70 it does drop some because of that um, situation. But, again, if I don't touch any of it, it will continue to go up. All right, and that's the, the living benefits right there. So now let's take a look at the minimum premium. Like I said, the no lapse guaranteed minimum premium. All right, so right here in the middle we have the monthly no lapse premium. Okay, so this is the minimum premium required during the no lapse period to keep your policy in effect. This minimum no lapse premium is two hundred sixty-two dollars and fifty-three cents. So remember, I said this premium uh, that this client would be doing is five hundred a month. So the no lapse premium two sixty-two, almost half of what he is paying on the regular. So again, something comes up, and you need a little bit of extra cash. You could go down to that no lapse monthly premium, pay it for a month or two, and then boom, uh, go back up right there. That's what I do with my IUL. In Christmas time, I drop my IUL down to the minimum, have some more extra money for Christmas gifts or uh, travel, whatever the case may be, and then I bump it back up in January. I do the same thing sometimes uh, in the summer when we go on vacation. Okay, so it can um, as long as you pay that minimum, you keep all those guarantees. All right, this may will make sure it lasts till at least fifty. After that, there's no guarantee it will keep going. Okay, um, but it does give you during those fifteen year surrender period. During that fifteen years, it does give you the ability to lower, increase, lower, increase. Um, and usually after those fifteen years, you probably have got a pretty significant cash value. You still might have quite that flexibility. No promises, but it could potentially still be there depending on uh, that cash value. Okay, now the last thing we're going to look at uh, before we close it off is the historicals. So that way you can see the S&P and the Barclays, what it looks like it's done over the last couple uh, years, 10, 20 years. Okay, All right. So here is the historical performance of each strategy. Okay, um, and what the indexed. Uh, what? Excuse me. This is what each the S and P and the Barclays did every year since two thousand, two thousand one actually, uh, and then what each strategy did. So you can see here back in two thousand one, the S and P five hundred did negative thirteen point five five. So the way I have it set up, the way my strategies are set up, if the market does that, notice my strategy would have done two point point two five point two five point two five point two five, and the Barclays wasn't there at that time. Okay. Um, because the minimum uh, cap is 0.25, okay? Or that's, um, excuse me, not cap, minimum floor. So basically, they're just going to say, hey, we'll give you 0.25 even when the market's doing nothing. Look at the next year, 2012, uh, 12, 2001 to 12, 2002, negative 19.74, 0.25, 0.25, 0.25, 0.25, okay? Because of that 0.25 floor. Uh, let's look at this year. Uh, 
16 and 17. 12, 16 to 12, 17. The market did 18. Well, notice the S&P 500 annual point to point, 100% par with a 13% cap. All right, because this product would be fully underwritten. You get 13, 9.5, 9 16.97. All right, because you have a monthly 4.25 cap. So that's why I get 16. Notice what the Barclays did. The Barclays did 12.3. You got 17.84 because it has 145% par with a 0% spread. That's fantastic. So there are going to be years where you do great. There are going to be years where you don't do as great. If you look at the 10-year average, the S&P over the last 10 years has done 11.5%. This product's done just under 9, 8.8, 6.9, 8.9. If you look at the Barclays, over the last 10 years, it's done 6. Look what the strategy's done. 10. 10 and a half. All right, because you're taking all those years with losses out of it. Look at your 2013, 2014. The F Barclays did 14. This strategy did 20. Can you imagine making 20% on your money? Now, obviously, that doesn't happen every year. But when the market's good, these strategies can perform. If you look at the last 20 years, the S&P has done 5.3. This one, this strata, these strategies, these indexes, uh, indexing strategies on this product, 7.8, 6.1, 6.3, 7.49. They've all outperformed the S&P, all because you're taking those losses out of it. All right. So yes, over time, these strategies look like they've performed relatively well compared to the actual S&P. And I like to show this because uh, I do show this to clients. I want them to see like, hey, take a look at what the market's done in previous years. And then take a look at what these strategies have done in previous years. And they usually still uh, stand up pretty well to them. Okay. And so that's pretty much it. Like I said, if you need to look at the illustration software, check out our other video with Danielle. All right. Um, she does go over a couple of other things in the illustration that I didn't go over as well. So I'd check it out either way. And that is the Pathsetter IUL from FNG. If you have any questions, make sure you leave them in the comments. Send us a message. Send this to your agents. Make sure they subscribe so they don't miss out on any of the future trainings that are coming out over the next couple of days and weeks. You all have a great day.